Well, hello everybody. Welcome to another day of class. If we recall from Wednesday, what we were talking about were equivalence classes and equivalence relations and partitions. And where we had left off is we had talked about the integers and we found the concurrence or the equivalence classes module 5. So mod 5 we said was an equivalence relation. We found the equivalence classes where everything was related to either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And so we had those classes. What we want to do now is look at those sets in a little bit more detail and talk about some relationships they have. And so we're going to go ahead and do what this says is create a Cleveland table. And I'll talk about what that means for addition and multiplication. And so that is, I want to look at these sets and decide, can we define an addition between sets? Can we define a multiplication between these sets? Notice that isn't something we've done before. We've talked about unions and intersections and differences and complements, but we haven't done sums. We have done Cartesian products, but not regular products between sets. All right. So with that said, what I want to point out here is that Recall that if I take the integers mod 5, the equivalence classes were 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if I look at the set that is equivalent to 0 mod 5, remember that was the set of all integers that looked like 5k such that k was in z, which was equal to things like negative 10 negative 5, 0, 5, 10. And if I write down 1, it's going to be all the things of the form 5k plus 1, which was something like negative 4, 1, 6, 11, and then dot, dot, dot in both directions. And then if I continue with this, I get things, I'm just going to write down the 5k plus 2, and then 5k plus 3, and 5k plus 4. So we decided that that's what our equivalence classes looked like. And so we had the five distinct equivalence classes for mod 5. Now, what I want to look at here is that if I try to define an addition between sets, that has to actually make sense. So what I want to think about is something like the equivalence class 1 plus the equivalence class of 2. I want to think about, well, what happens if I try to add these things? So I'm not going to find the union. I'm actually going to add. So that is, if I take something in here and I add something in here, what ends up happening? Well, if I take any element in here, well, if I want to do an example, I can take 1 is in here, and 2 is in here, and 1 plus 2 is 3, is in this set. Another example would be 6 plus 2 is 8. 8 is 5 plus 3. So again, we end up in this set. And so the claim here is if I take any element in here and add any element in here, I'm going to end up back in this set. So if I look at this, if I take something of the form 5k plus 1, I add something of the form 5k plus 2, well then I'm going to get 10k plus 3, but 10k is a multiple of 5, so that's 5 times an integer with a remainder of 3. So that is, if I take any element of this set and add any element to this set, I would add up in this set. So here what I get is 1 plus 2 is indeed 3. So that is the equivalence class of 1 plus the equivalence class of 2. Again, I'm adding these sets here. It's going to be the equivalence class of 3 because anything in here plus anything in here is in here. Now, that doesn't seem all that exciting because, well, we expected 1 plus 2 to be 3. But if we do something like, say, 4 plus 2, What is 4 plus 2? Well, that would mean take something in here and add something in here. So if I do that, I'm going to get 5k plus 2, or 5k1 plus 2 plus 5k2 plus 4, 
And so what I get is 5k1 plus 5k2 plus 6. Now notice, however, that if I actually look at this, I can factor a 5 out if I write this as 5 plus 1. So this is a multiple of 5. So if I divide it by 5 and took the remainder, I would get, well, the remainder is just 1. So what I get is, in this case, 4 plus 2 is actually just 1. So that's why what we're going to get here is a new definition of addition, where our adding of numbers doesn't work out exactly the same as we thought it would, because, well, we can get things like 4 plus 2 is 1, whereas within the integers, that is not something that would happen. So I think that's pretty neat that we're getting a new addition. And what we can do is we can follow that through and say, well, what are all of these things going to be added together? And we can also work with multiplication. So I'm going to try to make both of these tables. So if I wanted to multiply, what would that look like? Well, 4 times 2 would be this times this. And if I did that, I'd end up with 5k1 plus 2 and 5k2 plus 4. And so if I multiply, I get 25k1 k2 plus 5k1 times 4 plus 5k2 times 2 plus 8. I know I'm running out of room here, but the point is, is 5 divides this, 5 divides this, and 5 divides this. So if I divide it by 5, this would all have a remainder of 0. This would have a remainder of 3. So what I do get is that 4 times 2 is actually 3. Now we could go through that whole process, but if we remember that we actually proved that congruence mod n respected multiplication and addition. So what I could say is 4 times 2 is 8, but 8 mod 5 is 3. Therefore, 4 times 2 is going to be 3. And we can follow that process through and actually find not just an addition, but also a multiplication between these sets. All right. So. When I make a table here, what I'm going to do is list out all possible sums. And so I'm going to take 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and write that up on the top. And I'm going to say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And write it up on the left. And now. A Kaylee table is just going to list the sums of each of these elements. So I'm going to draw in little lines here to show where those are going to go. And I'm going to say, let's add these. Add these equivalence classes of the integers module 5. So if I do that, Remember now, I said that I can add these and then take them mod 5 because that was the proof we had that mod 5 respects addition. So 0 plus 0 or anything in equivalent to 0 plus anything equivalent to 0 is just going to be equivalent to 0. 0 plus 1 is 1, 2, 3, 4. And if I fill out this column, I'm just going to get 0 plus 1, 2, three, four. And now I can continue through and I'm going to do my second row. So one plus one is two. One plus two is three. One plus three is four. But one plus four is, would be five. But since we're taking it mod five, we get out zero. And then I'm just going to fill this in. We get three, 4, 0, 1, and then 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, and 4, 0, 1, 2, 3.
All right, so here's a big chart. What I want to point out here is that a couple things are happening. Is that if I take any of these sets and add them together, the first thing I want to notice is that I end up back in these sets. So I end up back in the set 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So those are the only things I'm getting here. And so what I would say here is that this set is closed under addition because if I add anything to together, I end up back in the set. Which, again, the integers are, for example, closed under addition because if I add two integers, I get an integer. And so what I'm trying to do here is say, okay, on this set with this operation, does it satisfy properties that we're used to? And one of those things is closure. Another thing we might look at is, is there an identity element? And so an identity would be something where x plus a is always equal to a. Well, for the real, or for the integers or the real numbers, the identity for addition is 0 because 0 plus anything is just anything. And now if we look at this, notice that 0 is also an identity for the integers mod 5 because if I take the 0 class and add it to any other of the classes I end up with the class I started with and we can see that from the table because I'm just ending up where I started in either direction. Alright, another thing that we get from the integers is that if I take something like an any element A I can find an element b such that a plus b is equal to 0. And normally, what I, or what I'm going to call this is an additive inverse. So if I add something to a, I get out 0. And if I look at the integers, I would just get b is equal to negative a. So if I add 5, I said add negative 5, I get out 0. 10, I add negative 10, I get out 0. So if I add the negative of the number, I end up at the identity being 0. And so what I want to think about here is, do I have additive identities here? Well, let's look at 1. Is 1 plus something ever equal to 0? Well, 1 plus 4 is 0, and 4 plus 1 is is 0. Sorry, 4 plus 1 is also 0. So in both directions we get that that's going to be 0. And so what we're going to say here is that the additive identity of 1 is actually 4. So what does that mean in context is the point here is that negative 1 is actually 4. Which is actually kind of neat to think about is that well negative 1 should just be negative 1 but if I want to subtract 1 from any number I could just add 4 so that is if I want to take 2 minus 1 I could st instead say 2 plus 4 and I'm going to get out either way the equivalence class of 1 because here again the additive identity of, neg of 1 is 4 <laughs> Sorry, the chalk is getting to me there. All right. In the same way, if I take 2 plus 3, I get out 0. So if I want to subtract 2, I may as well add 3. So what are we saying is negative 2 is equal to 3, and negative 3 is equal to 2. And so there are some nice properties here that maintain themselves from the integers we still have an identity we still have inverses we're still closed under addition but we have an entirely new addition defined and so we might call this addition mod 5 so if I'm going to add the numbers mod 5 I get a Cayley table is what this is called where my addition works out in this form all right with that set, I also want to look at multiplication. So I'm going to fill this table back in. Let's just start over with that. So 
So if I use multiplication, I'm going to get 0 times anything is just 0. And then 1 times anything in a sit cell. So I get 1, 2, 3, 4. And then 2 times 1 is 2, 4, and then 2 times 3 is 6, mod 5 is 1, and 8 mod 5 is 3, and then 3 times 1 is 3, 1, 4, and 2. 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. So if I look at multiplication again, I'm going to kind of go through those same properties. Is, is this closed under multiplication? Well, if I multiply any of the equivalence classes mod 5 together, I end up with one of those equivalence classes. So this is, as the integers are, closed under multiplication. Is there an identity element? And so for identity for multiplication would be x times a is equal to a. So now notice for the integers or the real numbers, 1 times anything is equal to anything. And so if we look at the equivalence class mod 1, we get 1 times 0 is 0 times 1 is 1, times 2 is 2, times 3 is 3, and times 4 is 4. So again, the equivalence class of 1 is going to form be a multiplicative identity. So the identity for multiplication. So this is the multiplicative identity. Now, we can also talk about inverses, and so what would a multiplicative inverse be? As well, the multiplicative inverse is a number such that a times b is equal to the identity. So the inverse of a would be the number such that if I multiply by b, I get out the identity 1. So, for example, for real numbers, for the integers, I don't necessarily have a multiplicative inverse because I can't multiply 2 by anything and get out 1. But if I want to do the real numbers, I'd have to multiply by 1 half. So the multiplicative inverse of 2 would be 1 half. Of 3 would be 1 third within the set of real numbers. But again, there would be no inverse within the integers because this is not an integer. Now, what I want to say is, there is no multiplicative inverse of 0 because I can't multiply 0 by anything and get out 1. But the multiplicative inverse of 1 is 1. And if I look at this, 2 times 3 is 1. So I know that 2 times 3 is 1. Hence, 2 inverse is equal to 3, and 3 inverse is equal to 2. Now what I want to point out is, well what does that mean is if I multiply 2 by 3 I get 1, but if I said something like what is 4 divided by 2 here, well divide by 2 or multiply by 1 half is the same as, so let's say 4 times 1 half should be the same as 3 times 4. Since 1 half is not in our set, what I'm trying to point out is that 1 half is the multiplicative inverse. So instead of dividing by 2 here, what I can end up doing is multiplying by 3. So if I take 3 times 4, I get 12 mod 5 is 2. So I do indeed get my 2 here. What's more interesting is if I take 1 third, so 1 third of 4, or the multiplicative of inverse of 3 times 4, would be 2 times 4. So 2 times 4 is 8, so 1 third of 4 is actually 3.
which I think is pretty interesting. I mean, I didn't expect things to work out that way, but there we have it, is if we try to multiply by the multiplication of inverse of three times four, that's really two times four, so four thirds is the same as three, it's in the set of integers mod five. Now, we wouldn't actually call it four thirds, we would actually say two times four, but I'm just trying to make the point here that our inverse times four and things end up working out not quite the same way as we thought they would because we have different inverses. Now notice here that four times four is one. If we look at four times four, we get one. So what that means is division by four is the same as multiplying by four. So that would mean one fourth is equal to four. So if I want to take two divided by four, I may as well take two times four. So in either case, I'm going to get three. And so I can perform things like multiplication and not quite division. And so if we think back to the beginner class, I said we're not going to use division. We're going to use some type of this divides this. And so when we're looking at this, when we say division, what we really mean is the mul multiply by the multiplicative inverse. Not everything has an inverse, but in here where we get at least the non-zero elements, so everything other than zero do actually have a multiplicative inverse because something times one is one, times two is one, times three is one, and times four is one. So we get a lot of nice properties that carry over from real numbers even that the non-zero elements will have a multiplicative identity and a multiplicative inverse. And so we get a nice set of numbers together with an operation where it's closed there's an identity and there are inverses for the non-zero numbers. Now we could give names to these sets that have these properties and we would do that in abstract algebra. So if you're interested in this type of thing, we do a lot of it in algebra, which is one of the other classes I'm teaching right now. But what we've done is we've defined an addition and multiplication that have some neat properties because they're not the ones that we expected. All right, along with that, I'm going to look at Z4 real quick, or the integers mod 4. So if I look at the integers mod 4, I'm just going to redo my multiplication table here. So these ones will change. Oops. All right. So I'm trying to save a little bit of time, but what I want to point out is zero times anything, if I use mod four is still zero, one times anything is still itself. But if I take two times two, now mod four, what I get is four mod four is zero, two times three is two, and then three times one is three, three times two is two, and three times three is nine mod four is one. And the point I wanted to make here is that there is still an additive, or sorry, multiplicative identity, which is just one. Now one has a multiplicative inverse, it's just one, and three has a multiplicative inverse, which is just three, but two does not have a multiplicative inverse. I cannot multiply two by anything and get out one which is a new experience from the real numbers, say. Eh? And even more interesting is if I take two times two, I get zero. So two times two is zero. So what I have here is I've taken A times B and I've gotten zero. Well, if I work in the real numbers, the only way that's possible is if one of the terms is zero. But now if I work in the integers mod four, I get two non-zero numbers that multiply to zero. So we're gonna call these zero divisors. And so that's a new thing that come up that can come up when we're dealing with non-standard addition and multiplication. So again, we can get interesting ha things happening. We can get new things happening and we can look at new sets with new properties that aren't quite the same that we're used to. And so we get out things like this can happen. Some of the old properties are still maintained, but we'd get some aren't. We get new things that can happen. And so it gives us something to kind of work with when we say, well, we can define a new multiplication or a new addition. 
so that we can get different properties we can look at and we can have well fun with that thinking about all the things that can happen all right I don't see any questions I was just kind of checking for those I'm actually just going to leave this lecture here. I know it's only, it's a short lecture, but I don't want to start functions, which is going to be our lecture on Monday because I don't have quite enough time to get into that. So I just wanted to spend some time and say, well, if I take these and I make these tables out, I can get really nice, interesting things happening. So I can look at a new addition, a new multiplication. And if you take abstract algebra, that's what you're going to be doing is looking at different types of addition and multiplication other than the usual addition and multiplication and deciding what properties they hold. With that said, thank you for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will see you on Monday.